Excellent. This is uh, an Inside Jerry's Brain call on Tuesday, November 20th, 2018, a couple of days before Thanksgiving, where San Francisco is shrouded in smoke off the campfire. Much of California is suffering, but uh, we are here talking about uh, co-creation. And uh, John Kelly just joined. Uh, John, I just turned on the recording, so we're, uh, we're off and running. And uh, Judy was just talking about her interests in how, uh, how we all see similar things differently, I think. I mean, just to, to paraphrase badly, but do you want to jump back into that? Yeah, I, I think a theme in my life for much of my life has been connections or connectivity um, in the broader scope of things, whether it's interpersonal or ideology or affiliation groups or other things. And more recently, I've been particularly interested in how those affiliations occur um, and the way that people make connections um, with thoughts, for one thing, because we each connect with thoughts and interpret what we experience differently. Um, and according to the brain researchers, some of whom's names I can give you if you're interested, it's because they go to a vault in our brain that puts like thoughts with other like thoughts. So if I've heard something about evolutionary behavior and I hear something new, it will track to the same spot in the brain most of the time. Um, it also depends on our pre-existing assumptions, which I would say isn't so much conscious assumptions as it is life experiences. And so how we react to something. You have everything you need. And that's part of why I've been a person massively interested in diversity since I was in my 30s. Mm -hmm. um, and just because this is uh, inside Jerry's brain, I'm going to share my desktop, partly because... Uh, here you are in my brain, Judy. <laughs> um, you've been there for a while because we met uh, back at an IFTF workshop for the American Chemical Society, <clears throat> which I've got connected to the things I did in 2006. Now, now, in 2006, I wasn't really doing the My Events thing very well. So you'll see a few things here. So apparently I did a, a workshop with AARP, um, but we met at the ACS uh, event that I was just sort of clicking on. Yeah, and, exactly. uh, we were trying to figure out what the future held and how a nonprofit that's as large and scientific as ours is should attempt to position itself for the future. And I'd have to say my candid assessment was the group wasn't real comfortable trying to go into the future and think about things that weren't yet measurable. <laughs> you know, science, scientists have a hard time sometimes with the future because they really want things, you know, if, if it doesn't, if it can't be measured, it doesn't exist. And, uh, and that, that, that puts a lot of walls up in, in different places. So, um, so here you are, and I've got you under 3M alumni, <clears throat> along with Mark Kepper and Robert Skillman. I don't know why they're there. Um, I haven't, that's interesting. Usually, I think I haven't visited this in a long time, because usually I connect alumni to staff here laterally. And then this, this might be a little bit of fun. Uh, usually I connect alumni up to the, the big mega thought called alumni which is right here. And that then connects me to all alumni from anything. So here's, this is just the A's. So this is a scroll bar down here. So we're getting to Axios alumni. So if I go here, Colgate, De Beers, Dentsu alumni, who did I put there? Uh, San Rahi and Frank Bile. Oh, I remember Frank Bile. I met him in 2011 at uh, Sustainable Brands 2011 in Monterey. He was with Landor at the time. I have no idea if he's still there. He wrote a book called Global Nomad 101. Oh, that's, oh, that's really interesting. Title. <laughs> <clears throat> yeah, staying safe and sane on travel adventures. And it's under travel tips, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So then if I go back to 3M alumni, I can go back up to 3M. <clears throat> Founded in 1902 as the Minnesota Mining and Manufacturing Company, which is under US blue chips, because back in the day we used to, remember we used to have blue chip stocks? Mm -hmm. um, the dual lock reclosable tape, next care band-aids, post-its. I've got some of the brands here, Scotch tape, Scotch guard, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Under Scotch tape, as I imagine, I have a uh, generic trademarks, which is brands that represent their categories. So Google, FedEx, Band-Aid, Aspirin, Photoshop, Q-Tip, Thermos, uh, Xerox, Hoover in England. If you don't vacuum in England, you Hoover, mm -hmm. uh, et cetera. Anyway. This is just a little, a little uh, brief digression, but, uh, but this is the, the kind of thing, uh, Judy, what I, I'm fascinated by the thing you just raised a, a moment ago, which is this notion that we 
despite looking at the same sort of things, we see things very, very differently. Sherry, glad you're back on the call. Thanks for, well, thanks for coming in. Not to take too much podium time, but um, I've been interested in that dimension of communication for a long time because people will say, well, that's a weird thing to get from that quotation or that book or whatever. Um, but more recently, I organized a symposium a year ago in 17 on title of which was science and in society, colon, why don't facts seem to matter? Mm. Uh, the whole lack of fact checking on things that were purportedly aligned to be science and so forth was really bugging me. So we had a panel in of people from different disciplines, all of whom connected with science, but had communications as part of their role. Um, the medical director for the state disease group at, at the medical association in the state department um, talking about infectious diseases, um, the acting head of a hospital who was interested in community outreach. You get the idea, different types of folks. Um, and as part of the background for that, I did some research and found this guy at MIT named Yuri Hassan, H-A-S-S-O-N. It's a really cool brain guy that looks at the mapping of the brain with electrical characterization and then right. put together a TED talk about that. Um, the gist of which is his final line is something. So be careful what you listen to. That's what you become because we create data files in our brain and where the information goes will actually change depending on language, context, whether you have a pre-existing assumption about the situation you observed versus not having an assumption and so on. Um, so the gist of it is, I kind of see everything connected to everything, and that's what I found intriguing about Jerry's brain, because he connects in multiple directions on things. He doesn't connect linearly. And so for a, a longer in-depth call on just that topic, I think we could explore how do other people see what they see and observe and, and then file as they file, and what are the implications of that for organizations and movements and social change and so on. Brilliant. Uh, and Judy, don't worry about airtime. Um, I will apologize because I may occasionally screen share as other people are talking so that I can do what I just did in the background because you had mentioned Uri and I had not heard of him. So I went and watched his talk. I put him in my brain. He's at the National Science Foundation. He's got his own lab at Stanford called the Hassan, no, at Princeton, sorry, called the Hassan Lab where he does his research. And oh. it, was really, it was really funny because I watched his lab mm -hmm. I think he must have moved because he used to be at MIT, I think. But in any event, he's a really cool guy and his yeah. talks are interesting. He actually has affiliations with four or five major universities. Like it's hard to figure out where he actually spends his time. Yeah. Um, and the one other thing I'll say is uh, he was difficult to listen to having, oh, is there, there's no C in Sasha Baron Cohen. Oh shoot, let's just do Baron. I have to spell right. Hi, Sasha. So I'm Judy. There we go. So, um, so I, I had a hard time listening to him with a straight face because of Iran Morad. Basically, in Who is America? He invents uh, <clears throat> he invents a uh, Mossad uh, soldier who is completely over the top. And I don't know if you guys have seen the documentary series or the humor series that that uh, that Sasha has done recently called Who is America? Have you guys seen it? No. Okay. Okay. Oh my God. Uh, this first look right here is worth it. Like this clip right here. Um, it, it's he basically takes people with really pretty out there beliefs about things like gun safety. And then he sets up a scenario where they think that he actually is this retired, you know, in Israeli commando. And they follow him into shooting commercials and uh, doing a whole bunch of different things. It's, it's insane the things that they walk right in and do. And he's using this very exaggerated Israeli accent where he, his eyes are stuck in his throat and everything else. And then Uri is, is Israeli and speaks exactly that way. And I just, like, the moment he started talking, I'm like, oh my God, my brain has been infected by Iran Morad. <laughs> um, so, I'm, so I'm actually going to link just for just for my own sake. Nobody else is going to understand what this is, but I'm going to link the, the Uri's talk to Iran Morad, uh, which will make me smile when I see it again. Uh, but one of the things he talks about is neural entrainment, which is I already had the thought brainwave entrainment, uh, which was under brainwaves and entrainment, for example. 
And I think that uh, uh, any of you heard of the Heart Math Institute? Um, <clears throat> so there's a theory that, uh, well, the, the, so there's a, I, I think there's a fact that your heart rate varies with each breath cycle. So as you inhale and exhale, your heart is actually speeding up, slowing down, speeding up, slowing down. And that this heart rate variability or HRV, um, let me see where I've got HRV. Uh, well, it should be right here. That's weird. Let's make that link. Here's HRV, heart rate variability. And let's connect this to heart, brain, and trainment. Bing, done. Okay. <clears throat> so um, there's a few people sort of doing research on this because it can be very calming to synchronize your breathing with relaxation responses. And um, uh, a buddy of mine had a little device called a stress eraser uh, years ago. And the stress eraser was like a $300 thing about this big with a little LED panel. And on top, it had a pulse oximeter. So you'd slip your index finger under the pulse oximeter. It would shine a little infrared ray through your fingernail and basically get your pulse rate, your pulse rate variability, a few other things. I think it could get oxygen content in your blood, things like that. And it was super interesting because the only exercise this little device was good for was to try to create a perfect sine wave on this little LED and put four little blocks under the peak of the sine wave. Because if, if you weren't quite there, it was just a biofeedback device, but if you weren't quite there, you'd get two blocks and then the, the, the wave would jag. But if you were sort of in this calm space and your vagus nerve was firing at the top of your breath cycle, you were you know, doing what they thought was this heart brain uh, entrainment, which was super fascinating, really interesting. Um, but there's people who are studying entrainment at all different levels, including social entrainment. Like what happens, what happens to groups of people when they start seeing or thinking something similarly? And then I'll just take it back to uh, what Judy was talking about a moment ago, which was, uh, I just made the link while you were talking, Judy, to priming, because one of the really interesting things that Uri says in his talk is that one, sen one sentence of priming created very different perceptual groups, very different neural reactions between two, uh, two test groups in his experiments. And what he did was he showed them uh, the plot of a show. And then for one group, uh, he told them, uh, the woman is having an affair in this situation and the husband is trying to figure out what's going on. And to the other group, uh, uh, he said, uh, the woman is innocent, the husband is very suspicious. So one sentence, basically different for both groups. Then they both watched the same thing. They both sat under an fMRI device while you know, having their brain scanned. And it turned out that their reactions were consistent by within group, but very different group to group, uh, depending on this one little sentence of having walked in. And I'm like, oh my God, that's all about priming which is part of you know, persuasion. And here's, uh, I'll stop in, in a moment because I, I keep realizing this, this connects to interesting things. So Robert Cialdini's latest book is called Persuasion. The book that put him on my map was called Influence the Psychology of Persuasion, which I have uh, under dangerous knowledge. Well, it, it, it means that we really need to be much more conscious of our and other people's behaviors. If you exactly. want to if you want to be effectively heard or if you want to effectively listen. And there's even some freaky stuff coming out of Arizona and some other places where people are, are claiming at least that they can measure neurological energy in the brain and that crowd thinking is not just the social interaction of a group of people that are all angry, but you're being influenced by the brainwave outputs of the groups that you're adjacent to. And so it would suggest that if we want to be effective humans, we have to be conscious and manage that absorptivity factor. Much as we would if we stepped into a room and saw that the room was angry, we might automatically assume a slightly psychologically defensive approach, or at least a protective approach, not if you know what I mean. Yeah, but it's yeah. the, the whole issue of people connecting to people, ideas connecting to ideas, people rejecting ideas because they're inconsistent with a group think they've already been exposed to um, and, and to take it a whole different direction, all of the dimensions of innovation that occur because of the differences in how people see things, which was something I spent a lot of time studying when I was at 3M, was what is it that made people innovative? Could I interview for that? <laughs> mm -hmm. Those kind of things. 
And it turns mm -hmm. out it all relates to the same sorts of things. The, the class of innovators will have very diverse outside interests. They will have hands-on outside interests that cause them to look at something and want to mess with it. Um, anyway, enough. That's, that's, no, that's great stuff. Um, and, and earlier, I went to this thought in my brain, emotion and membership in a group trumps reason most of the time. And unfortunately, I, the, the, the word trumps is an intentional pun there. Um, because, uh, you know, yeah. Trump's effects on, he basically understands this better than anybody does. Uh, so uh, this thought is linked to appeal to people's baser emotions. And there's a whole thought um, elsewhere uh, called Trump's favorite tactics, his playbook. <clears throat> so uh, give the fearful subconscious a voice, go with your gut instincts, but aim to disturb, paint the worst possible picture of the present, pump people's fear, make things sounds awful stall for the time. The media has very limited time. You can outlast the, the length of time they have to keep the camera on you. Uh, somebody else wrote the Trump rules of life and leadership. It was an Axios article. So I put down their seven, uh, their seven points because it was a good article. So when, when I hit something, you know, nicely written, I will, I will debrief into my brain. I don't know why there's no link associated with this particular thought There should be a link to the Axios article. So something went wrong here. Um, anyway, Gil, nice to see you. And I will stop sharing so we can see each other for a bit. And uh, did somebody go away? There was a woman showing up before. Yes, Sherry just wrote on the chat. She's sorry she had to leave unexpectedly. Um, she may drop back into the conversation, but I know that she had something else uh, going on right now. I was surprised she was in our call so early because she said she had something else she had to do. Um, Gil, we're just sort of uh, touring around, uh, and, and John, nice to see you as well, although you're, uh, you're now there twice and, and not on camera, but I, under, I, I understand where you are. Um, we've been going around this kind of connected conversation around connections and perceptions and, and things like that, and I'd love, to, I'd love to go back into that in any place that any of you would like to pull on a thread. And Judy, if you want to go back in, or Ken, if you want to pick up something that we, we talked about. Yeah, I could um, talk a long time about this. I'm kind of in connecting spirit. I'd like to know what other people think and what their own experiences are, and if they even have an example of where, I mean, you, you even hear, hear people say, in fact, it was a great technique. I noticed someone who never got in fights with speakers at the podium, even though he opposed their ideas completely, and I got, figured I needed to learn how to do that. So I watched him carefully in subsequent meetings and he prefaced it every single time with a comment that was, I'm probably looking at this differently, but, and then he would state the opposite thesis of the speaker. And only once in about a dozen times did the speaker respond, yeah, but you're wrong. <laughs> Most of the time they listened and it led to a thoughtful exchange, which I found fascinating. So that I put in my backpack, but, the whole notion of communication is a dialogue. Um, and the way we connect thoughts are unique and that's why it's good to have six, 10 or 15 people at the table because they'll bring different thoughts to the topic and it'll be richer. Mm -hmm. uh, was the phrase I'm probably thinking about this differently? Yes, or I, okay. I might be thinking about this from a different perspective or, or I could be looking at this differently because of my experience, but um, mm -hmm. He put a personal ownership statement in front of it so that he wasn't criticizing the man or the, the thought. He was voicing a different experience. And he was allowing right up front that other people might see this differently, et cetera. I, I mean, I, I'm, I, so I love the kinds of conversations that you're talking about right now. That, that's my favorite sort of thing where there's a, there's a touchy subject that's squirming on top of the table or in the middle of the room. And it's something that people normally would avoid, like Thanksgiving is coming up and a whole bunch of families are instructing their children, okay, don't talk about politics with Uncle Jeff uh, or whatever, right? Because they want to avoid whatever strife comes from talking about messy things. And I, I'm really interested in those messy things because I think that if we can calm down and listen to each other with care and step into it, um, we can get somewhere. That, that the goal of Inside Jerry's Brain is to, to do some of that. So I also want to invite people in with pretty different opinions. Um, but, but ways of diffusing tension, including humor, humor works uh, really well a ton, 
Uh, but self-deprecation is good. Uh, identifying your position as possibly, you know, different is really is really good. So so techniques like that I really love. I used to use self-deprecation a lot, but when I was the only woman in the room at 3 m it didn't work because the guys never use self-deprecation. Mm, I bet. <laughs> I bet. <laughs> that yeah. would be another interesting topic in terms of discussion across mixed gender, mixed race, diverse populations. Um, what are some of the adaptive skills that have been developed that means that society needs to develop more of those or um, somehow if we could share experiences so we understand that we're all a lot more alike than we're different. Mm -hmm. That's my hope anyway. I just threw a link in the chat window. I recently, actually thanks to Gil Friend, uh, as before, before Gil introduced us, I had, I had discovered this work of Dr. Renee Lertzman um, who is doing a lot of work on how to talk about climate change. And um, this is a little video she did for kids of, you know, how to talk. And basically you don't talk, you listen. So it's like, don't, if someone says something that you find you totally agree with, just say, that's interesting. You know, why do you think that? And, and what's behind that? And rather than getting activated of, you know, you're an idiot, you haven't, you clearly don't know the facts, blah, blah, blah. It's like, okay, so tell me how you came to that, you know, and what's your background for this? And um, so I just thought this was a, a nice little uh, thing because it's really done specifically. Jerry said, you know, we get Thanksgiving, the kids are being told not to talk about stuff. This is specifically for younger people, but it works at any level. And, Great, thank um, you. Yeah, and I, I'm trying to get a coffee date with Renee. She lives not too far from me, but she's really busy because I'm interested in some of the work she does around talking about climate where she says, you know, we need to address three A's. We have to talk about people's aspirations. We have to talk about their anxiety. We have to talk about their ambivalence. Mm -hmm. And she gives the example of ambivalence. You know, she's ambivalent about eating meat. She knows eating meat is really, you know, uh, harmful for the planet. And yet she eats meat and, or, or going to conferences, you know, like mm -hmm. I go to conferences to get out there and have my work be known. And I hate getting on a plane because I know that's contributing to climate change. So, um, I think it's a, a, a really wonderful way of opening up the conversation in ways, instead of trying to be right, of saying, well, what are the things you're ambivalent about and what produces anxiety in you and what are your aspirations? Wonderful stuff. So I recommend you, you check her out. Thank you. Could you give me her name again? Renee Lertzman, L-E-R-T-Z-M-A-N. -E -T -Z -L -E -R -T -Z -M -A -N. Okay. I, I just had her up on, on the brain. I don't know if you caught that. I didn't, but thank you. Yep. I, I, recommend recommend that the I, won't know, I won't necessarily know, to where, know where to go look for something sometimes when I get into your... Yeah, exactly. So one of, the problems, one, of, one of the problems here is that I wish the brain had a little um, bookmark or breadcrumb feature. I mean, what's funny is every thought I'm clicking on is scrolling off to the left here. This is kind of the breadcrumb trail of what, what I've been clicking on. There is no utility in the brain that lets me copy and paste this to you. <clears throat> so that you could see all the different things I clicked on and have a direct link to my brain for each one. Mm -hmm. that, would be, that would be a nice to have. So here's uh, Renee Lertzman talking about the psychology of climate change. Uh, and in fact, I'm going to link uh, that to the, and I just went to the link that Ken put in the chat. So I dragged it into the brain as you were talking and connected it. So I'm also trying to figure out where do I have conversations about climate change? Because I, I have a thought called climate change deniers. I also have one about climate change activists, evangelists, experts, and consultants, right? Um, but partly I think I need to have the conversation, you know, I also, I think I have a thought called some- Do you have pardon? one about climate change debates or, um, I don't know, something that gets both sides of it. I find that I, I'm quite annoyed because every time I look something up, Google or any other search engine does it based on what they think I want to see. And then I have to search the opposite of that to find the other side. Mm -hmm. So if I want to form my own valid opinion in pseudoscientific way, I have to take that second step because I don't get a balanced portfolio of information. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm just adding a thought called how to talk about climate change. And I'm going to connect it to the secret to talking about climate change, and I'm going to connect that back up to climate change. What was the difficult conversations one that flipped by briefly? Yeah, I'll go back to it. <clears throat> so Ken, here we thank go. Thank you for that reference. I, I hope I wasn't cutting you off. 
Oh, no, not at all. Um, I'm just, <laughs> I have to say, I had this experience on uh, on the ETAN calls, and now it's it's up several orders of magnitude with Jerry's brain flashing by of drinking from a fire hose. So, you know, <laughs> I'm sitting here going, oh, my God, there's so many things I could jump in at. The, no, well, that's gone. Oh, oh, this is, so, you know, I'm just. I'll be quiet. I, so please, no, 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 please. please I'm, enjoying your, I'm enjoying your brain as much as I'm enjoying <laughs> <laughs> same here same here so don't don't uh don't pipe down pipe up this is great and uh so this is difficult conversations which is under conversation also under conflict resolution and difficult stuff <clears throat> i don't remember what i have under difficult stuff adversity degrees of difficulty hardship ordeals i don't think i've visited this 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 zone in my brain for for a long time but under difficult com conversations are several books. So here's a book titled Difficult Conversations that was written by Roger Fisher, Sheila Heen. Roger mm. Fisher, I think of Fisher and, and Yuri of the Harvard Negotiation, yep, mm. the Program on Negotiation at Harvard, <clears throat> etc. So if I go back to Difficult Conversations then, here's Authentic Conversations, uh, Crucial Confrontations, Crucial Conversations, and How to Have That Difficult Conversation You've Been Avoiding which is written by crucial conversations because that's a very useful book which one crucial conversations yeah and is there's a one here called one called fierce conversations which may want to go here could you repeat cool. that fierce 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 conversation so that's so you know what <clears throat> so you know what i have it in my book it's just under conversation so i'm going to put it under difficult conversations so it connects to all those other things so here's the seven principles of fierce conversations, and it does not appear that I debriefed. Usually, if there's something like because I'm curious what that is, the, the seven principles. Sure, let's go and let's let's hope the link is still alive. So uh, here we go. Seven principles of fierce conversations. Master the courage. <clears throat> there we are. So why don't I copy this, paste it into our chat, and then go back to sharing. I'll paste it here so you can read it as I'm reading it. Then I'll go back to screen sharing. And while we're talking, I will add those seven principles just for grins <clears throat> because that's what I do. Thank you. <laughs> oh, thanks for suggesting it. So what I do is I'll go back here to the brain. So I will drag from, so, so to add a thought to another thought, I'll, I'll do a little bit of tutorial each time I, each Inside Jerry's Brain show. When I click on a thought, it rotates into the middle. So if I click on the, the text of anything, it goes to the middle. So let me click on seven principles again. Uh, and then I can connect any thought to any thought through these three little circles called gates. And so I'm going to put the seven principles underneath. So I just click and drag and it opens up an empty field. And if I type in, if I type in text that I know already exists, <clears throat> it will find that text and I can link to any existing thought. But in this case, I'm putting in a new thought, uh, master the courage to interrogate reality. And I know that when I do lists, I like to do one, uh, the number dot space and then the list item. So I'm gonna change the colon to a dot just because that's my style. So what I would normally do is, is digest this. <clears throat> and if this principle connects to other things I already have in the brain for different, for different reasons, then I would do that. So, um, Interrogate reality is really interesting. <clears throat> um. <laughs> this kind of how our brains think and track is just fascinating to me. Yeah, exactly. You and how they don't. Like looked at this before in different ways. Pardon? It looked, Ken offered some interesting thoughts. So I take it that it's something you have looked at, Ken, before in different ways or contexts. Yes, um, my, my focus is on conversation, um, how conversation specifically gets work done, as well as how to talk about things that uh, prevent us from getting work done. And um, I spent 10 years as one of the co-developers of the World Cafe dialogue process. And um, since then, I've gone off to develop my own process called Collaborative Conversations, which focuses specifically on, on how to get work accomplished, because it's really hard to make a living doing dialogue, but if you can bring dialogue principles in very practical ways to people, then uh, it's a lot easier to get paid for it. Cool. I have and about seven here. organizations that would benefit from that content. Oh, we should talk. I'd be happy to <laughs> tell you more. <laughs> I'm always looking for new clients. Um, a lot of them are nonprofits. They don't have a ton of money, but... Um, that's okay. I, I 
work with anybody. So uh, because I'm focusing on, on a process, not content, I don't need to limit myself to just nonprofits or just corporations or government. I've been around the kind of around the block. Mm-hmm. Jerry, as you're, you're doing this, I just want to put a, a bookmark on something. One of the things that comes up that is related to what um, Judy was talking about earlier uh, for me is Robert Keegan and Lisa Leahy's work on immunity to change of why facts mm-hmm. don't change people's minds. So I went to Harvard, I took their class um, and they lead off with saying, you know, uh, something like, I'm, I forget the percentage, so I'll just name 82% of people who are diagnosed with heart disease are told you'll die in five years if you don't change your lifestyle and 82% die. You know, So mm-hmm. their point is that the information and the threat of death is not sufficient to create change in people. So what do we do uh, to actually get that to happen? And their process is um, to uncover what they call competing uh, commitments. So they give the example of, let's say you want to lose weight. And this is one that can go in lots of different directions. But mm-hmm. so you, you say, I want to lose weight. That's my goal. And then what are all the things I'm doing and not doing that get in the way of that? Well, I'm not exercising, so that's I'm not doing. And I'm having two desserts a day. I'm eating dessert after lunch and dessert after dinner. And I'm eating uh, when I'm alone and lonely and, and uncomfortable and feeling down, right? So then the next column over is, what's the competing commitment? Well, although I'm committed to losing weight, I'm also committed to not feeling lonely. And if I'm lonely, food is my friend. So I'm committed to taking care of myself through food. And then that yields, there's a big assumption under there. The assumption being, if I don't eat, I will not feel good. And so let's test that. Let's just run a little modest experiment with a researcher stance to see what happens if I shift from eating, you know, sugary snacks to eating um, nuts, for example, where I can still feel that I'm, I'm getting some, some nourishment, but it's no longer empty calories. And check it out. So that's just, their, their work is really interesting on, on how people do and don't change. Um, and I, I figured you'd have something in here on your brain, in your brain on that, Jerry. <laughs> and so I, have you been watching as, as, <clears throat> as you've been talking? Cause I'm, I didn't I'm basically... watch the whole trail cause I was looking at him. So I, Oh shoot. Okay. So I, I, I went to, I knew I had uh, the book in here. So here's Robert Keegan mm-hmm. and his Wikipedia page. The W, the icon means that there's a link here associated with his Wikipedia page. So mm-hmm. if I click on the icon, if I click on his thought, it puts his thought in the middle or lets me edit it. If I click on the fave icon, it launches my browser to that web page. So he is uh, teaches at Harvard in the change leadership group. He's a de- developmental psychologist and an educator, also a, a psychologist because it's just a the great the larger category he's talked about the five orders of consciousness which i don't have listed in here bad 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 <clears throat> um so uh so in the meantime i realized oh I've, i think i've got a couple threads here and it was really lovely because as you were talking i was finding i know i have resistance to change so i just connected it to immunity uh to change mm-hmm. over here and in fact i can probably uh, i'll make this a little bit more explicit so that it shows up easier i'll just double <clears throat> i'll just make another link so that uh, immunity to change and the book immunity to change both show up under here. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, then on change, I have uh, one thought that I really like, which will interest you guys, is scales of change, which I'm going to color. So one, another thing I do, you'll notice every now and then there's a yellow thought or a purple thought. Um, so when I have a lot of things under a thought, and it's not obvious because there's gonna start to be a lot of stuff showing up around it, I'll color that thought. And uh, the two colors that I like to use here are uh, this purple and this yellow. Um, so now, now scales of change will jump out a little bit better from this big list of things under change. Uh, but I, I went to scales of change because I'm really interested in personal change, social change, systems change, technological change, organizational change, national change, evolutionary, cultural. These are all different kinds of scales, right? Um, and, and, Sometimes one group dictates what the rest of the groups do. So, you know, I think, you know, changing a population's opinion, uh, one approach is to have the preachers all say some message so that it goes out to everybody on Sundays. Another approach is to teach the children something at school so that it comes back into the household. So the city of Curitiba became the greenest city in South America <clears throat> by basically uh, adding recycling to the children's curriculum and getting them completely excited about it. Um, 
and then uh, having the kids teach their parents. Yeah. So there's a uh, Jaime Lerner was the mayor of Curitiba back in 1971 plus <clears throat> plus. He uh, he then did a whole bunch of really interesting things uh, to to sort of redesign Curitiba, including let me see if I've got visionary mayor. Uh, Nope, I'm, I'm trying to find whether I put, because this is a while ago, I'm trying to figure out did I put, you know, teach the kids recycling and have them teach their parents, but I don't think I have that in there. So at some point I'll go back to it. Well, along with what you were saying, Ken, one of the big things that, that I've observed is that, and, and I, I'm sure this is written about, but the, the whole context of group affiliation and you believe it if it comes from the people you usually talk to, you, you already pre-qualified them, so to speak, and there may even be a sort of a universality of viewpoint in a certain group of people, so that any fact that connects with that, you give more credence because it's supported by your whole group and so forth. And then it makes it very challenging to, and opposing ideas are almost not heard, or they're heard and dismissed psychologically because of that affiliation tendency and the underlying one to use your model would then be, well, I'm afraid if I think a different thought, these 20 friends won't like me anymore because I'm not agreeing with the group. And so it becomes one of those loneliness vectors or something that can cause resistance to change. Is that a, does that fit with what you're saying? Well, if we're talking specifically about Keegan, um, yes, he talks about that in his book, uh, Immunity to Change. And by the way, Jerry, he's got a later book out. He's since retired from Harvard. Um, mm -hmm. Lisa's still teaching. He's retired. They're both still at Minds at Work. And their latest book, I think, is called An Everyone Culture, um, mm. which is interesting because in, in Over Our Heads, which I read, I haven't read An Everyone Culture, Keegan says that you can't train development. You can only set up the conditions for teachable moments. Um, but now, an everyone culture is very specifically about training for development. So he's he's evolved in 25 years. Um, but um, there, uh, yeah, becoming a deliberately developmental organization. And um, therefore, the example they were working with the Department of Social Services in Massachusetts, and they walked in and discovered that everyone was terrified of making a mistake, you know, because if you make a mistake in social services, you are on the front page of the newspaper, look at this scandal, all these people. So when you're terrified to make a mistake, you're in a defensive crouch. When you're in a defensive crouch, you cannot learn. And I think that relates to what you're saying, Judy, of um, if I'm going to upset the apple cart among my friends and disagree with them, then I put myself at great risk. So I stay defensive. I'm not open to new information because I'm afraid I might lose my identity, my affiliation with this, with this group, with my team, my department, my, my, you know, boss, whatever it is. And that ties for me. I don't have Jerry's brain. I just, everything's in my head. I need, I need Jerry's brain, but that ties for me. You've into, got Jerry's brain. I'm right here. Yes, Look, I'm yes, taking notes thank for you. us. <laughs> Go ahead. For me, that, Sorry. That, that ties into um, something I, I read. I oh, lost my thought now. Uh, oh, I'm so sorry. That's all right. No worries. No worries. It'll, it'll come back. But, but this idea of, oh, yeah, uh, cognitive diversity. Um, you can have, there was an article in HBR, I think, about cognitive diversity. And it says you can have a very diverse looking team of all different ethnicities and, 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 and uh, genders. But if they've all gone, to Ivy League schools, guess what? It's not actually a very diverse team in the way that they think. They've all been trained to think in certain ways. So how do we make it palatable and safe for people to bring in other folks who say, well, you know, I don't have a four-year degree. I, you know, I, I heard this story once of a, a woman who was invited to a, a big gathering and she said, you know, I don't know why you want me. I have no degree. My expertise is in suffering. And they're like, that's why we want you, because we want people who are out there on the line suffering because you'll have information that we're lacking. So that, that becomes a, uh, a question for me of how do you make it palatable for, for organizations to listen to the people they tend to not listen to? And the same that, thing for that communities. That fits under diversity, too, because mm -hmm. one of the things I've looked at is trying to identify for individuals why I'm drawn to them, which is usually because they have a thought different than mine that I want to understand and integrate. And if I acknowledge with that person 
you know, Tom, I'm really glad you're here because I need your viewpoint. It's different than mine. It's informing my breadth of perspective. Um, it gives them more voice. And I think it's the same factor that you're talking about because you can certainly, I saw group think at 3M all the time. I mean, this is, there's a 3M way to do this. And we have to do the following and they almost just dismiss something that doesn't fit with what they think are the ways of getting things done. Yeah, I was asked recently, I was explaining my concept of collective intelligence to someone. They said, well, how is this different than groupthink? And that led me to create a little table of, you know, here's the characteristics of groupthink and here's the characteristics of, of collective intelligence. And, you know, in collective intelligence, we actively solicit dissenting <clears throat> opinions because we want to create a larger context in which they can nest and, and operate that spur us on to how to resolve this. Whereas, you know, in groupthink, any dissenting, any dissent is quashed immediately. So that's one of the biggest ones right there. Well, we, I had so, a slide and I don't know if I can find it because it's like 20 years old, but we called it the iceberg of diversity. And above the waterline were the things you could see, race, color, gender, et cetera. And then outnumbering by 10 to one below the waterline were the invisible diversity traits, you know, introvert, extrovert, um, Midwestern, Asian, um, you know, different, ways of thinking, um, intuitive, uh, you know, and we don't examine individuals or groups and the dynamics of the groups consciously around those traits unless someone in the group brings that model in and, and just works the model or depending on where the group is, frames the model. <laughs> but oftentimes it's easier to just work the model and try to engage people. Mm -hmm. I love this conversation. Thank you all. Who's jumping in? John? Uh, John. Uh, yeah. Uh, Jerry, I don't know if you have this separated out. I mean, the, the huge factor in all um, collaborative and, and difficult conversations is the actual differences that people are at least partially aware that they have. Um, there's a kind of work, uh, did, I, I forget how how much we talked about or whether you experienced future mapping. Mm -hmm. um, and there we do something deliberate. We push things into the future so that we can get further away from what people are most certain about. Uh, but we're also um, accommodating a, a different kind of diversity that, that we hope is in the room or we're pretty sure is in the room. And that is uh, there are people who know a lot about certain subjects and there are people who, who know much less and know that they know much less, but are still um, legitimate participants. And we're trying to figure out how to bridge that. And one of the ways, the, one of the key ways we bridged it was push everything into the future and we change the questions. So the initial question is, here's a newspaper story from the future. Do you think it will happen or not? Mm -hmm. you, you suspend the whole question of should and of course, people still vote their shoulds and they, and they vote no if they think it shouldn't happen. But it, 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 it gets inside their, their expectations in an interesting way. And, it's, and it, it, it works especially well if you do it in a group and you're in eye contact and you use your body to vote. So you put thumbs up, I think this is gonna happen, thumbs down, no, and like uh, uh, level hand means I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you standardize the 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 shape of the news story it's like five to seven word headline two sentences and a date then you can do a large number in a short amount of time so one example i used recently some people know a lot about china and the social credit system some people know zero about china and the social credit system uh, instead of focusing on china in the present i wrote an event that said 2022 three African countries adopt a Chinese social credit system. That was the headline. And then in the text, it was because they've been the recipients of large uh, investments from China, they were, you know, in, induced to adopt the system. And um, it has the interesting effect of, of legitimating uh, inquiry. Because oh, it's, cause some people say, well, it, some people just come right and say, I have no idea what this thing is. Can you tell who, who knows what this is and tell me? And other people say, I knew what it was, but I wasn't, I hadn't thought about it spreading to African countries. And, uh, you know, so you, you, you sparked a whole lot of, 
uh, interesting, non less competitive conversation anyway around that, just by asking for the vote on whether you think it's going to happen or not. Mm -hmm. John, what you're saying sparks like 3,000 things. I just went to social credit in my brain. Um, one of the things it sparks is um, a long time ago, not Pope Francis, but when Pope Benedict was pronounced Pope and there was white smoke from the Vatican, <clears throat> um, Jimmy Wales, uh, I, I happened to see him speak a couple days later, and he laughed and he said, you know, uh, right after Pope Benedict was made, uh, was made Pope, uh, <clears throat> I received a whole bunch of congr congratulatory emails from journalists saying, hey, wow, I noticed that immediately when I looked up on, on Wikipedia, there was like a fully documented version of Pope Benedict. And uh, he was, uh, uh, in fact, uh, in fact, um, there we go. Oops, Pope Benedict. Here we go. Let's go to Pope Benedict. Joseph Cardinal Ratzinger was his name, right? <clears throat> right. So um, we noticed there was a full complete page on, 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 Card on, on Pope Benedict. And, and Jimmy laughs and he says, well, well, duh, because we already had a full page on every cardinal, certainly the major cardinals who were up for possibly becoming Pope. So somebody went in, wrote a little paragraph that said on this date, at the, you know, on this date, there was white smoke and, uh, and Ratzinger became the new Pope and his, his taken name is Pope Benedict the 16th. And he was laughing because he knew that when you have a curated context, that is deep, you can immediately offer depth in each place. And one of the things that kills me about public discourse or any other kind of discourse is how uninformed we are <clears throat> and how we have to walk in and relearn and, re and sometimes reinvent everything. So there's a couple of formats for public discourse, um, in, in particular deliberative polling, <clears throat> where some research is done by third parties, which is then read by everybody in the deliberative poll and used as part of the conversation. I'm like, why aren't we talking over Wikipedia as if it were a piece of our civic discourse and using what it knows about zoning, what it knows about popes, what it knows about democracy, you know, as part of the conversation. And why does the news not see that as a, as a, as a, com, as a, a piece of the information commons that we could use together? So I don't understand why these pieces haven't fallen in place. It's kind of one of those mysteries to me, but it goes back to how do we get better informed in conversation? Because a lot of these, Wikipedia pages are pretty nice, really quick summaries to get up to speed on just about anything. Right. And just one other note, and I'm, I'm blocking on the name, but uh, it'll come right back to me. And if Gil's still on the line, he'll know who I'm talking about right away. The, the guy from, uh, from San Diego who was doing the um, simulations uh, has a workshop format where he throws out a question and to the tables and the tables can answer, but you can only answer if you're bringing up a web page that contains your answer. So it's like, hmm. here's the question. You don't get into the conversation unless you're showing us a web page and preferably That's several. Huh. And it's, it's an interesting kind of um, piece of judo on, on a group. The, the group has to have a certain kind of uh, knowledge affinity uh, ethic or, or it just falls flat. But, but um, I've seen it work if you, if you prep people. And of course, also every every table has to have a uh, a video projector aimed at a wall and a screen mm -hmm. that every, every other table can see. So it's like as you go around the room, you know, you can see the tables firing up their web pages and mm -hmm. and looking for them. Super interesting. Yeah, there's a whole bunch of I have a bunch of things under deliberative democracy, um, a whole bunch of things under decision making. Decision making is a huge topic. <clears throat> one one other thing I do a lot. Here you'll notice there's a couple purples and one yellow. Uh, usually the first thing I do when a thought gets crowded is I create a, a thought called articles about thought name. And, and, I, and I color it yellow so that it stands out because all of these are books, YouTube videos, uh, JSTOR, uh, research papers, uh, whatever, whatever about decision making, right? And, and some of these are just sub choice, like you know, too much choice should lead us to the tragedy, the tyranny of choice, uh, which is Schwartzman. Uh, let me actually color this one because it's a good one. <clears throat> Excuse me. Let me color it so it stands out a little bit more. Uh, but here's the tyranny, uh, the tyranny of choice, the paradox of choice. Uh, Barry Schwartz, there we go, at Swarthmore. Yep. Uh, who is, by the way, a fantastic public speaker. <clears throat> 
So when I see somebody really give a good talk, I put them under favorite living speakers, right? Doesn't that make sense? Anyway, uh, back to what you're saying, John, or to whatever thread anybody wants to pick up from that. And I'm gonna stop sharing for a little bit so we can see each other better. I have something, but I realize Gil hasn't spoken much and I don't wanna, I wanna give him a chance to jump in. Dr. Friend? Hey, buds. <clears throat> So I'm back with something that Ken was saying earlier when he was talking about um, his, Renee's work and his work with Renee. Um, <clears throat> you know, I think there's been an encouraging sign that we see um, more of our ilk wanting to open to conversations with the other side. And I'm sorry to use these uh, words, but uh, you know, lots of efforts to bridge the political divide in the United States. And what I typically hear from people is, we really need to talk to those folks. Uh, and the suggestion um, in um, what Ken and Renee are saying is that we actually need to listen yeah. to them. But there's another step there because we often say, let's listen to them with kind of an instrumental strategy of I'm gonna listen to them so I can figure out how to change them. And a really powerful conversation has to be, I think, much more open than that. And I have to go in willing for me to be changed as well as for them to be changed, yeah. which is dicey, right? Uh, scary, challenging of my identity and so forth. Um, I just got off a call with the Pluralistic Networks folks um, going through an exercise about um, um, how to say this, sorry, my brain's a little slow this morning, about listening with care, about a conversation to not understand or shape someone else's point of view, but to understand them and who they are and what they care about and what motivates them and what matters in their lives. And something, a different kind of possibility opens up in that conversation. Um, that's very powerful. I totally agree. Um, I just, uh, I've been browsing around this article, uh, HBR article, What Great Listeners Actually Do by Joseph Folkman and Jack Zenger <clears throat> in, from 2016, which is really good. It had a lot of, uh, you know, most people think good listening is just not talking over someone, going, mm. uh-huh, uh-huh, and then being able to repeat back. And actually, it turns out that good listeners do these things. They're cooperative, they ask questions to promote discovery, they make positive suggestions, et cetera. Uh, then I also had up listening in general because I happen to believe, so one of my beliefs is that we're in an epidemic of not listening, mm -hmm. right? So th there's a thought right up here. Up, up top here is a pin board. Anything I drag up here stays up here. So my beliefs is always top center in my pin board. Ooh. And so one of my beliefs is we're in an epidemic of not listening. Um, and Anand Giridhara Das has been really, really good at expressing this. I don't, have you guys listened to any of his stuff? So Anand is awesome. He uh, wrote a book that got him some attention a while ago called The True American, Murder and Mercy in Texas. And it was about a, a murderer and his victim's mother, I think, who became friends. And it was a really interesting sort of textured uh, story about justice and mercy and and forgiveness and whatnot, that got him attention. But then, uh, then the thing, the, the, the talk that really kind of put him on the map was this one. You'll notice I like it, because uh, <clears throat> everything I put under it is what I derived from the talk. And he says, look, our, our, you know, our, our, we here meeting at the Aspen Institute are buddies, and you're like my family, but we're part of the problem. Mm -hmm. We haven't been listening, right? And then uh, the more recent TED talk that he did is this one, a letter to all who have lost in this era. Um, and he says, look, I heard you, but did not listen. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and it's super, really interesting. Um, and I, I've got that under bridging the cultural divide, which I should connect a little bit more explicitly to listening well. Uh, and then one last thing I'll say while we're here, just because I'm experimenting with free associating my brain and seeing what that does to conversation, because I realize what I'm doing is I'm taking us off multiple threads we were on that were really lovely. And I wish I could, I wish I could slow the conversation down and then like hit a button and all of us could be talking about each of the little fractal tips at the same time, like in parallel universes, that would be kind of cool. Mm -hmm. That being difficult, 
Um, I'll come to uh, one of the things I kind of got to, this is also my, one of my beliefs, is um, I was looking at, um, I was looking at like principles for, op like principles for operating society, but what, what should we do, right? And for example, like the 10 commandments ought to be principles for running a society, right? But the quiz I ask people all the time is, what is the second commandment? Anybody know? Number two? Thou shalt not kill. No, that's like five or six. What's number two? The first is thou shalt have no other gods before me, which tells you how insecure God is. Bingo. And also says it's okay to kill other people who believe in other gods because right. I'm, I'm your only God. Right? And those people who believe they've got a God, they're wrong. So go, go, go. Right. Number two. What's number two? Covet thy neighbor's wife. <laughs> you mean thou shalt not? Um, <laughs> that's, that's, Sorry, I already get that. That's my problem, you know. No other. It got got that one backwards, but that's further down the further down the queue. That's like eight or nine. Is number what's, up, what's number two? Second commandment of the ten commandments that were handed to Moses on a freaking tablet from a burning bush. Like, must be important. What's number two? Isn't it no fault? The, the Catholic number two is that thou shalt not take the name of the Lord in vain. Um, I think that's up there. The one I have is. They count. No graven images. Ah, uh, okay. yes, right, right. Because when Moses came down from the mountain, they were worshiping graven images. Right. So yeah. here, so I've got ten commandments. Right. <clears throat> number one, no other gods before me. Number two, no graven images. Number three, don't take the Lord's name in vain. And there are different versions of ten commandments. This is kind of the one I found, and I'm perfectly happy to to figure out what other perceptions are. Keep the Sabbath holy is number four. Honor thy father, and mother. Six is don't kill. Adultery is seven. Theft is eight, false witness is nine, covetousness is 10. And I'm like, wait a minute, wait a minute. Um, now, Islam and Judaism obey number two. You go to a temple or a mosque, you will not see any figurative art. Guess what? Christianity has all kinds. Guess who violates the Second Amendment every day and twice on Sunday? Right? So one of my big questions is this. Why does Christianity constantly and flagrantly violate the Second Commandment? Like, what is up with that? They got into propaganda early. Exactly. So I want to go back into lighter, lighter waters because as I was searching around for what's a decent operating system, the one I got really was from Thich Nhat Hanh is deep listening and loving speech. I, this to me, if, if we all practice this, if we learn to listen better, which goes back to the conversation we were just having, and then speak lovingly, meaning don't assume the worst, right? Start from, start from an assumption of, of trust, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, actually, I need to put this under examples of the relationship economy in action. <clears throat> um, I need to put simple basic things like that. Deep listening and loving speech needs to show up there. Um, so for me, this is a really nice operating system for humanity. You, you start from this and lots of other good things happen. You start from this, then uh, the whole notion of rights, like freedom of speech and whatever, like, well, this, this, is, this is there, right? This, this, this will take us to places where we figure out where do your rights end and where do mine begin kind of thing. Um, so anyway, I thought I would share that and then pause again. I want to go back to listening for a second and something you mentioned earlier, uh, I can't remember the man's name, who said one, one uh, sentence of... of um, my brain is not working here. Uh, priming, one priming sentence changed everything. So in my work, what I do with people is I prime them to listen and I take them through a combination of some old indigenous practice and Otto Scharmer's four uh, levels of listening tied to breath. So as I move them deeper and deeper through their breath into their body, I have them move from uh, I'm not really listening. I'm just listening for agreement where I don't have to think very hard about what's going on to, oh my goodness, you disagree with me. Now I need to be more grounded in my body or I'm going to have problems to I'm now listening for what is it like to be you? What are you moved by? What are you interested in? What are you passionate about? What are you afraid of? Um, what's it, what's it really, you know, what's your life experience that are coming out as you're talking? And then um, the last one is what's enlivening in this conversation? It's, it's a core principle that I've been exposed to for a long time now, that the future is born in the present moment through conversation. So that means there's always a threat of aliveness. So what is that? And, and can we identify it? 
And sometimes it's easy because someone will say something and with the hair on our arm stands up, like, that's alive, you know, or, or we go, oh, no, and that's alive too in a different way, right? So, um, and then once I've got people through that, that somatic process, I take them into, now get into pairs or triads and tell a story of someone who was an important mentor for you when you were a child or an adolescent. Don't go too much past that because then you start, in those, those eras in, in our age, we tend to be idealistic, right? And share that. And what happens as a result is, oh, and the, and the people listening, their job is to listen with their hands on their bellies from those deeper levels. And then um, feedback. As you were talking, I felt this. I had these sensations. Not, oh, that reminds me of my Uncle Bob, right? But you really stay with what's present in your body. And in the room, you can feel this huge shift of people who had came, who come in with hardness of proof to me this is worth it to, wow, I now know you at a different level. And the conversations that evolve from that are much more productive. So I build myself as a conspiracy theorist, because if you know that the Latin for conspire is to breathe together, my theory is if you breathe together, you'll have better conversations. I invite people to prove my theory by, by doing this priming and then moving into more difficult conversations, but only after they've heard each other talk about something real, alive, and human that we can all relate to, because everyone can go, oh, man, I feel like I know your grandmother now. That is so cool. Thanks for reminding me of the etymology of conspiracy. I just put it in. Um, I also changed uh, don't kill to don't murder per Gill's note in the chat. And then per what Ken was just saying about paying attention to your body, I wanted to take us sort of out to the edge of that. Um, I don't know if you, any of you have heard of Bessel van der Kolk. Um, one of many brilliant people in dealing with psychological trauma. Uh, in fact, I have a thought healing, uh, healing from or dealing with trauma, which has uh, a bunch of these people, Richard Strozzi Heckler, Nadine Burke Harris, uh, Gabor Mate is fantastic. There's a bunch of them. But uh, Bessel's book, The Body Keeps the Score, is particularly interesting these days because we, the body sort of stores a lot of stuff that is trauma. And I'm, I'm really interested in trauma because I think one of, one of the people who affected me a lot is Alice Miller. And I don't go into Alice Miller waters very often um, because they tend to be pretty uh, controversial. But one of the, if you want to find an interesting thought in my brain, go to contrarians who make or made sense. This is part of my beliefs, so it's right under my beliefs. It's purple, so it's easy to find. These are all people who've, who've, who've sort of absolutely influenced my point of view about why I think the way I think. Um, Alice Miller was a psychotherapist in Switzerland who wrote Drama of the Gifted Child. She wrote enough books that I've got a separate thought about her, uh, about her books. So here's the drama of the gifted child, uh, Das Drama des Begabten Kindes in 1979, uh, about a whole bunch of different things. And she convinced me, well, actually, uh, my like, first love way back when in undergrad introduced me to Alice Miller's work uh, and, and convinced me thereby that we, we, have, we have institutionalized a series of kinds of trauma that we don't recognize as institutional trauma that even the, the things we do to babies automatically without thinking because that's what we do to all the babies are in fact traumatic. And call me a snowflake, whatever you want, but I actually completely believe that. Um, so so I, th I think that uh, this notion of paying attention to your body is sometimes extremely difficult because you know, I'm gonna overgeneralize, but men often have no read on what their intuition or their body or their emotions are saying. And you know, I remember long ago when a, a different girlfriend asked me, like, so what do you feel? And I, I like looking inside and it's like fog. You know, I see, I see fog and I'm not quite sure. So I started doing some work and that helped a whole ton. But but if you go into a conversation where you're asking people to track their body, and Ken, I'm fascinated by whatever stories you might have or how you do this, because with people who've never taken a look inside and tried to clear a little bit of the fog, that's a really hard conversation for them. They're in they're in very uncomfortable waters. They feel very vulnerable in a way that they don't like feeling. If they're with colleagues from work, they don't want to feel vulnerable in front of colleagues at work. That there's like a whole chain of, of things that are unleashed for them if they feel that they're suddenly like in, in, in like quicksand. So I, I'd be curious like how you take that or just a, a little story maybe. Yeah. Uh... 
again, it comes to priming. So, you know, it's all context dependent. I've done a number of public workshops, um, most of them in Paris in the last two years. Um, and I, I have a, um, a process of, of working with the amygdala that I, I have people go through. But the first thing I do is take them through the listening process and have them pair up or get in trios so that they're, they're primed for that. Mm-hmm. Um, I have them do body scans. So I lead them through a body scan, a, a seated and a standing body scan. They, they do at least two or three of those per workshop. And the idea of a body scan is not, it's not imaginal. You're not imagine what it feels like. It is observing. And the instruction is if, as you move through your body, you find something that feels like it wants to shift, go ahead and, and shift it. You know, it's, you're, you're perfectly fine to move here. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's, a, it's the development of awareness. So in one day, it's really hard to take people into really deep places, although sometimes they get there on their own. Um, so I do the listening, I do the body scans, and then I, I have them um, uh, I have a, a K, it's a mirrored K on the floor. So I, I put tape on the floor in the form of a K and I have about a foot and a half between it and the reverse image. And on one side is the fight, flight, freeze response. Um, and on the other side is feel, flow, and tend and befriend. And in the middle is their fear. And I had somebody brought a dragon, a lovely dragon to be put in the middle. So that people go and stand in each one, they name a fear for themselves. And they they stand in each one of the the fight, flight, or or fear responses, um, uh, fight, flight, freeze responses, and Mm -hmm. actually embody it. So, you know, if you're fighting, throw some punches. If you're you're fleeing, run in place. If you're frozen, really freeze and and put that on your face, like, (gasps) you know, and then shake it out and go to each one. And then... Um, after you experience all three, go stand in the one that is um, feels like your default response around this particular fear. And then we're going to move across. We're going to take that big leap and step across our fear. And the opposite of freeze is to feel. So what would it be like if I felt what this fear really is? How would I, what would I experience in my body? Mm-hmm. And the opposite of, of um, flee is to flow. What if I just, instead of running from this, flowed with it? How would that inform me? What would I do? And again, I'm asking people, organize your nervous system and your body in a way that allows you to do that. Make facial expressions, breathe that way, make gestures. And the opposite of fight is to tend and be friends. Say, so if this wasn't a, um, uh, an immediate threat to my existence, but I know it is a threat out there. How could I go over and say, what are you here for? What, what information do you have for me? Um, Why are you showing up for me? And uh, how could we work together? And then I I have people debrief that. And that's, that's like a two and a half, three hour exercise because it's a lot of stuff. Um, That's wonderful. And and what I, what I got that was so interesting (laughs) So I had this, this, this French engineer there. And um, when we were doing that, he was so, he's like, well, how do I know which one to step into? I said, it doesn't matter because you're going to go to all three. He says, no, no, I need to know which one to go to from which one is first. That's going to change everything. I said, it doesn't matter. Go to the one your body is drawn towards. But how do I know which one my body is drawn towards? <laughs> he really had that, that wall, you know, in, in Chinese um, martial arts, like Aikido, you have three centers. You have your, the head center, the heart center, and the, and the gut, right? And you can be cut off. Most people are cut off from one or the other. And his cutoff was at the neck. He didn't have any sense of his body, right? Other people, they're big on heart, and they don't know what's going on down below, or they don't know what's in their head. So he was really cut off from his body. And I had him do his, a couple of body scans, and he was able to do it. And then he did the, the listening exercise, and he reported back, he said, as I was listening to my partner describe her, her mentor, I felt like a whole thing in my brain opened up and there was this movie of her life flashing before my eyes. And I got so much more information than I have ever received before from anybody. And I was like, dude, you just had a major, major breakthrough today. You know, you really, he shifted because in my experience, Information doesn't change people, but somatic experiences, engaging them in deep conversation and moving their bodies and having them explore what are you afraid of and what, are you, what do you want to move towards really has the power to move people and change their behavior in important ways that I think are, are ignored by the vast majority of, 
conferences and, and workshops that I've been to. I, I don't want to go to some place where people are talking at me anymore. It doesn't work for me. And, and I don't do this nearly enough when I facilitate. Like, like if, if I remember, I get people to get up and move around or whatever. I don't do enough of what you're doing. Um, it's lovely. Well, let's do a workshop, Jerry. Yeah, that'd be great. Yeah. Um, I, I just went to the fight or flight response, which is, is, is in, in Wikipedia as fight or flight. It doesn't have freeze. So I just added or freeze response. And then I mm. noticed that I didn't realize I'd put this in before, but I have the tendon befriend response by Shelly Taylor, uh -huh. um, who's a psychologist at UCLA, uh, who's, who's one of whose students, I guess, is Susan, Susan Fisk. That's interesting, too. Uh, because Susan works on social cognition. She's at Princeton, a social psychologist who's worked on the, uh, ba, 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 is it the person I'm thinking about? Yeah, uh, the, the competence, the warmth and competence model. Have you heard of this? I've not. So, and, and, and what's, I, I go here with a little bit of trepidation because I think what you were just talking about is much more important than this. But, but this is the popular model among managers and executives and companies who are trying to figure out how do we how do we build customer loyalty that's why i've got it connected to customer loyalty right mm -hmm. and so there's a stereotype content model that was developed but but it's like organizations that exhibit warmth and competence are seen as good you want to go toward them you mm -hmm. want to affiliate with them you want to give them give them your loyalty like warmth builds trust and you'll notice i, I put the parenthetical duh after that um and uh so so it's, it's interesting, people, uh, one of the problems here is that people tend to see warmth and competence as inversely related, mm -hmm. right? Yes. <clears throat> There's an article here, just because I'm nice, don't assume I'm dumb, written by Amy Cuddy, <laughs> who's also connected to that research. Is that and, a culturally bound perception? Uh, very likely, um, very likely culturally bound in different ways across the world, yeah. And I yeah. suspect part of that has to do with, with gender difference as well. You know, um, men who are, are warm and competent, you know, tend to be seen as snowflakes, as Jerry said earlier. You know, it's like you, you know, it's, um, I've had people tell me that, that um, uh, they can't be seen as nice because it's seen as weak. You know, you can't be respectful and, and cordial because that's weak. And it's like, no, I think it's actually strength. And, and we have um, Brene Brown's work on vulnerability, you know, that shows that when you're vulnerable, people go, wow, I want to move towards you. It's when you're being an asshole, you want to run away. Um, something in here that I haven't seen pop up in your brain, Jerry, is uh, the concept of limbic resonance. Do you have something on that in here? The I don't know. Of love? <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, let's see, my machine is slowing down a little bit. Limbic hijacking, limbic regulation, uh, limbic system, lim ba, ba, ba. Yeah. General theory of love talks about limbic resonance. Yeah. And, yeah. Um, that was the first place I came into that. And that's something that, that I think Judy mentioned earlier, where you walk into a room and you know instantly, oh, there's been something going on in here that I need to be really careful about. Or you walk in and go, Resonance? Oh. Resonance, yeah. Okay, I'm adding it and I will look it up and do more on it. In fact, I'm gonna go right now and put this. It's with, um, with the work of heart math, actually. Uh -huh. when, you, when you come into, when, you're, when your nervous system is calm, I have a Qigong teacher, and when I, I get within 30 feet of this guy, my whole body goes, ah, uh, you know, yeah. he's got this field. I experienced that with Pema Chodron also. I was at a uh, lecture she gave and I went up to talk to her and I was about 10 feet away and I was standing talking to her and I realized I can feel this woman's calmness is just there's this calm radiating from her that is palpable in my body this is I'm gonna stand this is lovely maybe I have maybe ask some more questions you know so there is a very there is there, there's something palpable if you're attuned to it maybe it's hard yep. to measure well, I, I think we all insulate ourselves from it Unconsciously, frequently, um, I had sort of an epiphany years ago and was suddenly being bombarded with these signals from everyone I encountered from the supermarket to the gas station to wherever. And mm -hmm. I had to talk to a friend who was a really good spirituality person um, about how to guard a little bit about that, not to become hardened or averse to it, but conscious of it and, and monitoring my own response, so to speak. 
and it was a powerful four-step lesson. It was like something simple like notice, name, consider options, execute. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, but you notice that you're stepping into it and you give it a name to give it an identity so you can frame it and then you decide how open you want to be to hearing it or whether you need to be protective or whatever that might be and then you can execute. But you're executing with a sort of a she had great imagery. Imagine a semi-permeable bell jar around you, protecting you from whatever you need. And if you put that in place, it will protect you. Yeah. And, and it works. I mean, I've used it when I've gone into angry rooms, and it works mm -hmm. because it allows me to sort of dial. And I don't have to shut people out. Um, but I think what you're talking about, Ken, would be a wonderful topic for a, an hour or more is discussion in terms of these dynamics. So add that to your list, Jeremy. Um, do you want to frame that as a question or as a statement for a topic for a call? And I'll type yes, it into I'd, our chat. I'd like to have it as a topic for a call. Uh, how would you phrase it? Oh, good question. Ken, why don't you phrase it? <laughs> yeah, if you want, Ken, if you want to put that in the chat, that'd be... Okay. Think about it for a little bit, put it in the chat. I just wanted to do two slightly distracting things with my brain while you do that and notice that we're getting close to 90 minutes. So we should probably wrap at the half because <clears throat> I could go on all day like this, but, but, but. Um, so I went to Snowflake because we talked about Snowflakes and just a couple of amusing things. Uh, Snowflake is an urban dictionary phrase. Urban dictionary is not safe for kids, but boy, is it funny for definitions and all that kind of stuff. So I use it uh, you know, every now and then like bro and brony and all that kind of stuff. Um, so I connected Snowflake to identity politics, uh, to neologisms that fueled Trump and the alt-right, conservatives and Snowflake. I guess I didn't put that many here. Um, and it sort of comes from this, this notion that you are not the beautiful or unique Snowflake from Fight Club. So Snowflake kind of, kind of found broad popularity from the movie Fight Club, uh, actually probably from the movie. I should uh, connect this to the you are not the beautiful snowflake just because the movie was much more popular than the book, I think. <clears throat> and then that snowflakes are creating a backlash like the snowflake rebellion, right? Backlash uh, against multiculturalism. Uh, Everett Piper, you know, Oklahoma University president slams the snowflake rebellion. They're angry about all these snowflakes coming up. Uh, the, the sort of identity politics has become a target of its, of its, uh, in itself, which is something I'm extremely interested in. It's one of those good touchy issues that I think is worth, maybe, maybe we open that can of worms up for a different, uh, a different uh, inside Jerry's brain call. I think that would make a nice, a nice topic as well. Um, and then I wanted to go back to what was the, what was the page we were on? Oops. Um, when we started, I had I was basically looking at uh, a list of facilitation things. What was on that list? Uh, let me see if I can find it just by typing one because it usually does most recent. <clears throat> uh, nope, 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 none of those. Shoot, uh, it's in one of my tabs, but my my um, instrument panel is basically blocking my tabs. Hold on a second, let me go back out of that. Find it. To see someone else has as many tabs open as I do. <laughs> I know. So the seven <laughs> principle fierce conversations. That's what I'm looking for. So let me go back to sharing. Fearless. Find, find fierce conversations. Fierce. Okay. Yep. Fierce conversations. Let me go back to <clears throat> fierce conversations and show you one other thing that might be amusing. So here's the seven principles of fierce conversations. I'm going to connect that to one of my favorite thoughts in my brain, which is enumerated wisdom. Think. So here goes enumerated wisdom. So I have just linked this really, like I think these are phenomenal um, instructions. I've just linked it to um, enumerated wisdom, which is the five whys, uh, the five whys process, uh, five myths about healthcare around the world, five things young folks should do, five ways to think about ethics, five steps to create a new habit. So just randomly to go to this one, uh, this is an article, so I could go to it. It's from Tess Marshall uh, out of Zen Habits. And uh, the practice of the new habit is more important than the habit itself. That's interesting. Uh, so anyway, I collect up things that look like interesting, li useful lists 
um, under enumerated wisdom. If it doesn't look like a list, um, I have a thought called non-enumerated wisdom, where I put things that don't say five, three, seven, nine, two, or whatever. And then I have one uh, called dubious enumerated wisdom, which is, uh, <laughs> which is uh, the four cognitive modes, uh, the adapter, the mover. This is from a new map of how we think, top brain, bottom brain, which is Stephen Coslin. Uh, here's a book on him. Basically, I believe in hemispheric specialization, and this is a book trying to debunk uh, hemispheric specialization. So, uh, so I wrote here, I disagree with this logic. And then when they talk about the four cognitive modes, I put that on a dubious enumerated wisdom. Sorry to be whipping through things so quickly. Um, notice that dubious enumerated wisdom I have over the 10 commandments. <laughs> I, I, I just realized that, right? Um, and so, Covey too. And Covey, why did I do that? Cause I read the book and I like it. Um, it's huh. kind of superficial, though. Yeah, he's basically ticking off why it, we trust people who really promise they're going to do something. Change really, it just it's very be surface behavioral <clears throat> rather than um, deeper change. And Ken, what I liked about what you were saying was the sort of the depth of affiliation and association of things that you do in your workshop, which I agree would take a lot more time because it's bordering on moving into the spiritual mm -hmm. um, and and a lot of awareness that doesn't come easily to some people. But your model works because I had an employee who was the most oppositional guy in meetings I'd met in years. And he would come back the next day with constructive suggestions. And mm -hmm. The second time he did that, I said, what's going on here? Because you react this way, but this. And he explained a family dynamic of jumping to decisions that had adverse consequences. And I said, because your suggestions are, so, well, so I said, well, why don't I give you the topics and the input the day before so you're not cold in the meeting? And he said, would you do that? And I'm like, yeah. And so it was like a flip switch for him. And his, I, I started getting from people in the organization, what'd you do to John, Judy? I mean, <laughs> and I, I'm not even sure he was aware of why he did what he did until I asked the question. You know he may that, have, but um, it, I, it, I, your I mom will. <laughs> when I work with groups around that, I, I say any really important decision that you make, make it in pencil and then come back in three days and revisit it if it's at all possible. Because let system two thinking kick in because, you know, the, the next morning you, you're in the shower, you go, oh, my God, I just thought of something that's really going to impact this, right? And we rush to action so quickly. I, I honestly think that if we could put that pause button in, in so many places, it would, it would make the world a much better place. And the, the rush to action is the whole reason I, I develop collaborative conversations. There's two conversations you have before you start coordinating action. If you don't do those, you have a lot of problems. So, um, yeah, I, I really love what you're, you're saying there. I think it's very, very important. Agreed. And Ken, <clears throat> Ken I took you the, the way you phrased the topic, <clears throat> then I put it in the spreadsheet for upcoming Inside Jerry's Brain topics. Okay. And all we need to do is pick a date and time and I'll send out an invite and we can okay. see what happens. Fantastic. Let's you and I do that offline and, and um, maybe I can talk to you a little about how you see that unfolding. So it'd just be useful for me to talk that through with you. Yeah. That sounds great. And Judy, if you want to make sure you're on the call, we'll make sure we schedule with you. So yes, that, uh, I would like to be on the call. This is like my heart zone of what I'm most interested in delving into. Love that. I'm interested Absolutely. in all kinds of things, but this is a really core value framework. Um, <clears throat> we are now at 90 minutes. Ken, you were about to say something. I'd love to hear what you're going to say. There, there is one thing that flashed across your screen really quickly that I'm very interested in. I would love a call on dangerous knowledge. Oh, good. Oh, great. <clears throat> Let me. That was uh, a go. really intriguing little, you know, oh my God, I want to see dangerous knowledge, you know, so. So let me uh, enter it. <clears throat> this is where I'm planning out what to talk about in the future. Uh, it's on, <clears throat> this is on the website. So if you go to insidejerrysbrain.com, you will see upcoming topics or something like that. I've embedded the spreadsheet on one of the pages for the website. Um, and if you're on, <clears throat> if you're on the Inside Jerry's Brain Google group, you have permission to edit this. Um, so, uh, Judy, I don't, are you on the, I don't think you're, I've got you on the inside Jerry's brain list yet, but I'll, I'll add you to it. Or are you? 
I think you might be. No. Okay, I'll, I'll make sure you, you'll, you'll see a little Google Groups invite to be on that list, which is where I announce upcoming calls, you know, that kind of thing. I think I am, but double check it. I think we did this once before and I wasn't the first time, but you maybe added me and or invited me, but double check and send it again if you need to. Sounds great, will do, <clears throat> will do. And Gil, I will add you as well. I really like this system and how it works. Um, any closing thoughts? Any last words for this call? Thank you. Thank, Thank you, too. Thank you. Uh, great to hear from all of you folks. Uh, hope to have a camera working in the future. <laughs> it worked briefly. We, we could see you at the start. It was nice. That was my phone, but then the phone signal was so weak, I had to switch to the laptop. Very gotcha. dazzled, dazzled, as always. Thanks, everybody. This was totally fun. And uh, send comments to the Inside Jerry's Brain list if you want to talk this through. I'm going to post this video to YouTube and then send a link to that <clears throat> to the Inside Jerry's Brain list, put it on the website. If I remember to do all these things, I need my own like Provenance checklist. So uh, for like media management, because I'm, I'm, I'm the chief, the chef, the, the chief, the cook and the bottle washer. Well, this, this uh, is is really helpful. And I found myself taking notes and then halfway through realized I didn't have to, I could just wait for the YouTube to come back and then I could capture a bunch of these things that I can't remember instantaneously. Sweet. And I wish that there were a feature in the brain that let me just copy paste the breadcrumbs, the, everything I've just clicked through, that would be, at least you could then sort of sort through which ones I touched, but not, not a feature. I will see if Harlan would ever think about building that in. So um, thanks everybody. This was phenomenal. Um, I will see you guys. There's another call Friday at 10 a.m. If you're not out shopping for deals, uh, we'll go from there. What are the, what are the um, topic? What's the topic for Friday? Uh, the topic for Friday, I think, is vulnerability and trust because I'm really interested in Brene's approach to that um, and it, it, very inspired by her and a bunch of other thinking on, on this. So that's the, that's the topic. Great. Cool. So this Friday at 10, and uh, we'll try to make sure that everybody's in the conversation. All right. Thank Happy Thanksgiving. Take care. Thanks, guys. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye-bye.